This morning I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there with peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. What happens when we pray? If God is sovereign over all things, and if Jesus is king, then do our prayers even matter? Why do we pray at all? These are some of the most common and fundamental questions in the Christian life. <laughs> questions that get at the heart of what it means to trust in God in the midst of all of the disappointments and darkness of our fallen world. Maybe they're questions that you have asked before. Maybe they're questions that you're asking right now. Many ways, each and every Sunday that I preach, I'm not only preaching to you, but I'm preaching to myself. And that is especially true this morning. If you've ever prayed and wondered if God was even there in the midst of the silence. If you've ever prayed and wondered why would God listen to the prayers of somebody like you, a broken and sinful human being whose prayers aren't worthy to be heard. If you've ever prayed in the midst of this world, with all of its darkness and brokenness, with every piece of news, with every disappointment, with every cancer diagnosis, with every failure, you've ever wondered, do prayers even work? I want you to know that this passage is a deep encouragement to us this morning. You see, in the book of Revelation, John gives us a vision of how prayer works. It's a vision of the prayer of the saints rising up to God. And in this vision, we get a glimpse of the true power of prayer, of what happens when we pray. Does prayer actually change things? God has given us the grace of prayer as a weapon against sin and darkness in order to usher in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we look at John's vision in the book of Revelation, I want you to see that prayer not only changes us, but I want you to see the way that prayer changes the world. So first thing I want you to know, I want you to know that God is there in the silence. He's there in the silence. Look with me at Revelation 8, verse 1. John tells us that when the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, for the last several weeks, we've been looking at John's vision of the scroll of seven seals. The last two weeks, we've looked at this interlude where we see this vision of all of heaven erupting in worship and praise up to God. This interlude came in the middle of six seals being opened before the seventh is broken. And so what we have witnessed over these last month or so, as Jesus, the Lamb of God, took the scroll and opened each seal, is this progression. The first four seals bringing judgment. The fifth seal, a vision of the saints, of those who've been persecuted, the martyrs who've offered up themselves to the kingdom and their prayers. The sixth seal opened, coming with 
earthquakes, and then worship. All of heaven filled with the sounds of holy praise. And now as the lamb opens the seventh seal, all of this has built suddenly to this awesome moment of silence. All of this building, earthquakes and prayer and worship and judgment all have given rise to a holy silence. And the question that you and I have to ask is why? Why the silence? Why silence for half an hour? Finally, we've come to the seventh and final seal and all of heaven goes quiet. Well, in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of silence before God as an expression of awe and reverence. Habakkuk 2.20 puts it this way, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And the prophet Zephaniah even associated silence with the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. This is Zephaniah 1.7, be silent before the Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. And so the silence we are seeing here in Revelation 8 the silence that comes with the opening of the final and the seventh seal is the kind of silence that shows honor and reverence. It shows awe before the holiness of God. But it's also the kind of silence that is a calm before the storm. The kind of silence that speaks louder than words. It's the kind of silence that forces every one of us to confront all of our fears and all of our failures, all of our wounds, all of our sin, and all of our shame. Because if we're honest, it's the kind of silence that makes us incredibly uncomfortable. Microsoft headquarters is in Redmond, Washington. And there, there's a chamber that currently holds the world record of being the quietest place on planet Earth, okay? Now, for most people, I think you'd all agree that if you go to a rock concert, it, you're gonna be overwhelmed by the power of the volume of sound that's coming rushing at your forehead at 130 decibels. But you see, there's also an equally overwhelming power that comes with silence, especially this kind of silence, where here in this chamber, it is negative 20 decibels. Now to put that into perspective, if I were to whisper to you right next to your ear, it would come at 30 decibels. The sound of our own breathing is 10 decibels. Microsoft soundproof chamber is so silent that every little noise almost becomes deafening. You can hear your own heartbeat you can hear the sound of the blood passing through your veins. You can hear the sound of your bones grinding together in their joints as you move. And for most people, this silence is so overwhelming that they can only last in the chamber for a few seconds. It's too much. It's too overwhelming, why? because we don't realize just how much ambient noise we live in every single day. And what I want you to see this morning is in the same way, when we are silent before God, we are overwhelmed. Why? Because we aren't aware of all of the ambient noises that we fill our hearts with every single day. You and I purposely surround ourselves with noise. We are constantly scrolling our phones, listening to podcasts and music. Most of us can't drive a car without something going on in the background. If you have ever stood in a line 
waiting to pay for something. What is everybody in line doing? <laughs> They're on their phones. Why? They can't stand to be alone with their own thoughts. Now, it's not that any one of these things is inherently bad or sinful. It's just that they're distractions, and that can be just as dangerous. We fill our lives with noise because they distract us from being alone with our own thoughts. And our own thoughts make us deeply uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because in those moments of silence, we feel vulnerable. We feel exposed for who we are before a holy God. And the great irony of all of this is that it's actually when we fill our lives with the most noise that God seems most silent to us. But I want you to know that God is there in the midst of the silence. He's there. And so don't distract yourself with the noise, but I want you to hear his voice this morning. It's just as he came to Elijah in a whisper. He's there in the midst of silence. And it's when we begin to peel back all of the noisy distractions of this world and we are still and silent before the holiness of God that begin to hear his voice for who he is and what he has promised and what he is going to do. Verse 2. It's in this holy silence that John says he saw seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And quiet anticipation. Seven angels are given seven trumpets. Can you imagine it? All of heaven is silent. And then you see seven trumpets. You can almost hear them playing before they're even blown an instrument that represents a great, mighty sound of God's judgment that will pierce the silence. But not until the prayers of the saints break the silence first. It's the second thing I want you to know. Not only is God in, there in the midst of the silence, but God receives our prayer as a holy offering. Verse 3, we're told that then another angel, different than the seven, came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. So in John's vision, he sees the seven angels. They have seven trumpets. They haven't blown them yet. It's still quiet. And then he sees another angel. And this angel doesn't have a trumpet. He has a censer. Now, what's a censer? A censer is a covered bowl usually about this size. You could hold it in your hand. Usually it could be seen hanging on a chain. And it's a covered bowl, one with each side, one on the bottom, one on the top, usually made of metal. And it's used to burn incense in worship. Now incense is this kind of fragrant, sweet collection of spices and frankincense that would be placed in the censer on top of hot coals. So as this mixture of spices and frankincense hit the hot coals, it would begin to burn slowly. And smoke would come out of the censer, and it would rise up to heaven. And this is what John is seeing, an angel holding this censer. It's a golden censer before the altar of God. He goes on in verse 3, and he describes it, saying, And this angel was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Okay, so what in the world is John seeing? Well, in order to understand his vision, you need to know something about the offering of incense in the temple of God. In the Old Testament worship, they would burn incense as a symbol of the prayers of God's people rising up to heaven. So there, if you can imagine in your mind seeing this golden bowl of incense burning, and as the smoke rises up to heaven, it was a picture. As the smoke rises up to heaven, so do the prayers of God's people. We see this in the psalm, Psalm 141. 
The psalmist writes, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice. When I call to you, let my prayer be counted as incense before you. What's the psalmist asking? He's saying, let my prayer rise up to you, O God. Let it be a fragrant offering to you. You see, because it was the priest that would offer incense on behalf of the people. Their job as priest was to serve as mediators, a go-between between God and the people in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And this is what John is seeing, an angel serving as a mediator, holding the prayers of the saints with much incense before the throne. John's already used similar language back in Revelation 5. When John said that he saw the 24 elders fall down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now we can't go on without first asking, who are the saints? Who are the saints that John sees here? in this vision. Revelation 5, he talks about this incense rising up to heaven, which is the prayer of the saints. And here in Revelation 8, he's talking about the prayers of all the saints rising up before the throne. Who are the saints? Well, the saints are not some upper echelon version of Christianity whose prayers are somehow more worthy than anyone else's. Now, the Bible makes it clear that saints are anyone who are followers of Jesus Christ. This morning, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for your salvation, that makes you a saint in the kingdom of God. And the reason that is good news for us this morning is not only in Christ are you now seen as holy and righteous, But that means everything that we now bear witness in the book of Revelation regarding the prayers of the saints is a promise for you. These aren't just the prayers of some far off, unattainable kinds of people. These are the prayers of God's people for all time and in every place, including yours and mine. And so as the prayers of the saints rise up to God, there's something else that's happening here that you and I have to understand. That as the prayers of the saints were offered in Old Testament worship, they were also offered as a sense of sacrifice. There was something sacrificial about their offering. We see this in the book of Leviticus, that on the Day of Atonement, When the high priest would go to bake an offering on behalf of the sins of all the people, he would then take a censer full of coals and bring it to the altar of the Lord. Leviticus 16, 12 puts it this way. I want you to listen for the similarities. And the high priest shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. Does that sound familiar? In Leviticus... We see the picture of the high priest, the mediator between God and the people. And in order to make a sacrifice on their behalf for all of their sins, he offered first incense as a cloud that would cover him as the high priest so that he could approach the mercy seat. Here in the book of Revelation, we see an angel, a mediator angel holding the prayers of the people in a censer, offering them up to God, offering up as a holy sacrifice before the throne. Verse four, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints 
rose before God from the hand of the angel. Okay, so we've asked the question, what's a censor? We've asked the question, who are the saints? The question remains, who is the angel? Who is this priestly angel? Who is this mediator? Who is the one who has given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints? Who is this one who holds the prayer of all of God's people in the palm of his hand? Well, for centuries, many have associated this angel with Jesus. And while I don't necessarily think it is Jesus per se, I do think this angel is his representative in his high priestly ministry. Let me tell you what I mean. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our high priest. And he is the one who offered not incense before the throne, but he offered his very own blood for you and for me. What that means is that Jesus Christ died on the cross as an offering to sacrifice himself for your sin and my sin. And when he died on the cross, he offered up his own blood once and for all. Not so that we would be needed to be covered in incense any longer, but so that our prayers would rise before the throne any time that we pray. Because of the blood of Jesus, and because his blood covers all who trust in him. This morning, if you are a Christian, if you have received the gift of salvation in Christ alone, if you've trusted in his sacrificial death on the cross for you, that means that your prayers are received as a fragrant offering to God every time that you pray. Not because you are righteous, but because Jesus is. And so if you've ever wondered, why would God listen to me? Why would he ever hear the prayers of a broken and sinful person like me? Why would he care about what I want, what I need? what I long to see him do. I want you to know this, he cared so much that Jesus died on the cross for you. And now covered by his blood, your prayers rise up to heaven and they are acceptable and they are received as a fragrant offering to God. Prayer is our communion with the holy and living God, an invitation that sinners such as you and I could come up to the mercy seat of God, that we could bow before his throne, declare that he is king, and pray knowing that our prayers are not only heard, but they are received as a holy offering. R.C. Sproul put it this way, it's one of my favorite statements about prayer. He said, prayer does change things, all kinds of things, but the most important thing it changes is us. As we engage in this communion with God more deeply and come to know the one with whom we are speaking more intimately, that growing knowledge of God reveals to us all more brilliantly who we are and our need to change in conformity to him. Prayer changes us profoundly. And so this morning you might think, well, where is God? Is he even there in the silence? I want you to know he is there. You might be wondering when I pray, does he even care about my prayers? I want you to know he cares deeply. You see, because not only does prayer change us, prayer changes the world. It's the last thing I want you to know this morning. God's kingdom will come through prayer. God's kingdom will come through prayer. Look with me at verse five. Then the angel took the censer 
filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. It's an incredible vision. Much like the rest of Revelation is an incredible vision. Because just as it was when the Lamb opened the sixth seal with the opening of the seventh brings fire and thunder and lightning and an earthquake, all powerful images that the Bible associates with the final judgment and the coming kingdom of God. The difference here that I don't want you to miss is that John's vision of the seventh and final seal shows us how prayer is intimately involved every step of the way. There is a much larger story that's unfolding with each seal as it's broken. As the scroll is unraveled and each of the first four seals bring the four horsemen of judgment, the fifth seal was opened. And in John's vision, the fifth seal was not judgment, but it was prayer. Revelation 6, verse 9. The prayers of those who had offered up themselves for the kingdom of God cried together with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It was their prayer. And as the sixth seal is opened, it's in response to that prayer. And then as the seventh seal is opened, John is giving us a vision of how prayer works. And the truth is, if we were to really understand all that John is describing here for you and for me, it would completely and radically change the way that we pray. You see, because I think there's two great errors that we make when we pray. And again, I'm preaching to myself as much as I am preaching to you. I need to hear this this morning. And in many ways, they're the same kind of errors that we make when we come into this sanctuary on a Sunday morning to gather as God's people to worship and to pray. One is that we would make it a rote duty that would we simply pray or gather for worship because we feel like we ought to. Whether it's out of some traditional or cultural compulsion or out of some warped sense of duty, we think, yeah, I, I've, just, I've got to say my prayers today. In the same way that you may have shown up today for worship. It's Sunday, so we're going to church. But there's another error I think that we make with prayer and gathering on a Sunday morning. And it's the kind of error that we make when we think none of this even matters. It's the kind of prayer that comes not with complacency, but with being hardened and calloused by cynicism. It's the kind of prayer that comes when you've been let down time and time again kind of prayer that you might pray just after watching something on the news, something that fills you with fear, and you think, how long, how often have we seen these things? Or maybe it's the kind of prayer as you think about our own country and all that we face, particularly in the church, as we see everything that we hold dear unravel And thank God, do you even care? The kind of prayer that you might pray when you're praying, prayers filled with tears of grief over the loss of someone you love dearly, over a terminal diagnosis, and you thank God, I'll pray, but what good could it do? And maybe this kind of prayer that you pray after you've given in once more to that besetting sin that you can't seem to shake. The question we have to ask is, does prayer work? Is it powerful? Does it change anything at all? And what I want you to hear this morning 
is the book of Revelation gives us a vision and a promise that prayer changes everything. You see, because the images of the book of Revelation are meant to reorient us. It uses these images because what we see in front of us is too basic and we've grown too accustomed to it, too much ambient noise. And so the images of Revelation are meant to show us something that's more real than you and I see every single day. It's showing us what is happening in the heavenly realm before the throne of God when you and I fumble through broken words when we pray. What happens when we pray? Does prayer even matter? John shows us they matter so much that when Jesus, the Lamb of God, opened the seventh seal, all of heaven went silent. It went silent so that the prayers of all of God's people could be ushered up to the throne. Our prayers matter so much that John tells us that an angel was set apart to put them into a golden censer and to offer them up before the Lord, to be joined with Jesus, who is our high priest, who now lives to pray for us. They matter so much that Jesus, right now, in this moment, is praying for you and for me. And they matter so much that here in verse five, John tells us that after the prayers went up to heaven, and were received as a holy offering. An angel lit them on fire and threw them back to the earth. The prayers of the saints became a holy fire that will one day bring in the kingdom of God. Our prayers are nothing less than participation in the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's why Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Peter Forsyth was a Scottish pastor who ministered in England at the turn of the 20th century. One of his primary topics in all of his sermons and his writing was the coming kingdom of God and the authority of Jesus as the king. As I close this morning, I want you to listen to what he wrote about prayer. He said, the real power of prayer in history is not a fusillade of praying units of whom Christ is the chief, but is the corporate action of a savior intercessor and his community. A volume and energy of prayer organized in the Holy Spirit and in the church the Spirit creates. Listen to this. The saints shall thus judge the world and control life. Neither for the individual nor for the church is true payer an enclave in life's larger and more actual course It is not a sacred enclosure, a lodge in such vast wilderness, but however intimate, it is the most organic and vital context of affairs, private and public. And listen to this, if all things work together deeply and afar, it is for the deep and final kingdom of God. What is he saying? He's saying prayer is not some holy huddle where we retreat away from the world any more that when we gather on a Sunday morning that we do so to remove ourselves from the world. But we gather here on a Sunday morning to worship and to pray, to usher in the kingdom of God. When we pray on our own in the holy, silent stillness before him, we do so to usher in the kingdom of God. To pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this morning, I want to ask you, what do you believe about prayer? Do you see its power? You see, because with every fear that we have, we've been invited to pray, your kingdom come. 
with every sickness and every disease, we've been called to pray your kingdom come. With every rumor of war and report of division and violence and hatred, we pray your kingdom come to Gaza, your kingdom come to Ukraine. With every bit of uncertainty that you and I have about our own country, with every false proclamation about human identity and sexuality and where truth comes from and who we belong to, we've been called to pray your kingdom come. We pray and we gather on Sunday mornings not to remove ourselves from the world, but to advance the kingdom of God against the principalities and powers over this present darkness. And by the power of our high priest, Jesus Christ, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, our prayers rise before the throne as a fragrant offering to the Lord so that God might set them on fire and bring his kingdom come to earth once and for all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, teach us to pray. Oh Lord, as I pray that, teach me to pray. Oh Lord, forgive us for the way that we've treated this grace how quick we are to discard it as powerless and ineffective or how quick we are to treat it as some kind of duty. But, oh, Lord, would you resurrect this grace for us? Grant us once more the power of prayer that even today as we leave from this place, we would see not only have you now sent us out into the world, but what we've done here in this last hour has further advanced your kingdom here in Dallas in the world. It's your name that we pray. Amen.